Good morning. This message is not brought to you by Exfoliage. We'll get to the news broadcast in one minute. Just, you know, I just love... I love art. <laughs> okay, I especially... I especially love art. Okay. <clears throat> News, broadcast 8. Sanhedrin, the High Court of Justice. So now, if you were ever wondering who the Sanhedrin was, it's kind of like, what, the Federales? Urgent news. Here we go. Sanhedrin, the High Court of Justice, broadcast 8. The Sanhedrin was the highest court of justice amongst the Jews and the Supreme Council of Jerusalem. It comprised 71 members under the presidency of the high priest. It was Roman policy among their subject peoples to leave local administration as far as possible in the hands of the native authorities of each province. So in Judea, the Romans had not taken all the administration into their own hands, but had preserved the Sanhedrin as an administrative and judicial body though they had somewhat restricted its powers. In particular, the Roman governor reserved the right of capital punishment exclusively for himself. <clears throat> the power of the Sanhedrin was much dis diminished by Herod the Great, so as to enhance his own power and authority by restoring the Sanhedrin as the administrative body of the country. The Romans could claim to have given the Jews as much as they could want. However, although the Roman governor usually did not intervene in the workings of the Sanhedrin, his control over it was, in fact, considerable. The high priest, who was the president and convener of the Sanhedrin, was himself a Roman appointment. And the governor naturally chose someone who was favorable to Rome, Pilate's predecessor, Valerius Gratus, appointed and disposed several men in rapid succession until he found one who was suitable pro-Roman. This dependence on Rome was emphasized by the fact that the high priest's ceremonial vestments were kept in Roman hands. These sacred vestments were locked up in the Antonia Fortress and were only allowed out for the high priest to wear them on the occasion of the great festivals and the necessary time of purification beforehand. That the sacred robes should be in the Gentiles' hands irritated the population of the Romans, felt that it was a useful sign of their ultimate authority. It remained their policy, however, not to interfere in the actual workings of the Sanhedrin. And so some of the Jewish elders felt that through the Sanhedrin, they did enjoy autonomy, however limited. Okay, urgent news. Our broadcast opens on the morning following the arrest of Jesus and the night trial before the Sanhedrin. Prior to the arrest, Jesus had had his last gatherings with his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem. They had celebrated their Passover meal together in the course of which Jesus had introduced a new understanding of their meal, interpreting it in terms of his coming death, which would bring redemption even greater than that of the original exodus from Egypt. Jesus was arraigned before the Sanhedrin on purely religious charges. But it was difficult to find an accusation that would stick. Jesus' teaching had been hostile to the temple. However, he never actually said that he would be the agent of its destruction. 
the charges culminated with Caiaphas asking Jesus whether or not he was the Messiah. All the Gospels agree that while Jesus accepted the title, he found it misleading. Jesus therefore referred to himself in different terms using the language of the book of Daniel which refers to the persecuted servant of God who will in the future be vindicated and raised to authority by God. It was most likely this statement rather than the claim to be Messiah which constituted blasphemy in the eyes of the Sanhedrin. But it was the title of Messiah which had political as well as religious implications and which would constitute the grounds for condemnation by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor.